now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Let's head out west to Dodge City, Kansas for an episode of Gunsmoke. This episode, entitled Kitty Caught, was originally broadcast October 16, 1954. Gunsmoke. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. <laughs> Anybody here this morning? I'll be right in, Doc. All right, Matt. <laughs> I'll just be... Oh, the girls that grow so tall in Kansas. The girls that grow so tall in Kansas. The girls that grow so tall and the boys, oh, they love them all. Uh, oh, what's this? Oh, oh wow. Well. And they marry them all in the fall. In Kansas. Now, that's a poor way to start the day, Doc. <laughs> oh, well, what's a poor way to start the day, Matt? All right, getting up in the morning. Uh, getting up the way you do, maybe it is, Marshal Dillon. Uh, but not out on the prairie, where all the little birds are. <laughs> what started you off being a happy little bird this morning, anyway? Oh, where's Chester? I'd rather talk to him. <laughs> well, he's due back any time now. He's due back? Yeah, he took a prisoner over to Wichita a couple of days ago. He did? Oh, sir, if I'd have known that, I'd have gone with him, Matt. Well, what for? Oh, just to get out of Dodge for a while. Well, you've been out of Dodge for the last two days. Oh, yes, but delivering a baby in a mud dugout isn't exactly what I was uh, thinking about, man. <clears throat> yeah, I know what you were thinking about. <laughs> oh, uh, hello, Chester. <laughs> Hi, Doc. Uh, how was Wichita, Chester? Oh, see, that's a big town, Doc. Real big. Isn't it? Yeah, but I wasn't there long. The Santa Fe going east got there at noon, and the next one back here left at 2 o'clock. Oh, you could have stayed another day. Heavens, yeah. Oh, how often does a man get a chance to have a little fun? Well, I would have, but the sheriff there had some news he wanted me to tell Mr. Dillon. Some news? Yes, sir, it's about the Carp brothers. They've been hanging around Wichita the past month, and then they left. The sheriff said he heard they are headed this way. I didn't even know the Carp brothers were in Kansas. I thought they worked the Dakota Territory. Well, that's what the sheriff said, but they must have got drove out. Anyway, he said they was awful broke and hungry looking, but as long as they didn't try nothing there, he left them alone. Bank robbers, aren't they, Matt? Yeah, so I've heard, Doc, but nobody's caught them at it yet. Well, we'll catch them if they come to Dodge. Yeah, maybe. But they could be here right now. How come the sheriff didn't send me a telegram, Chester? It'd have been a little faster, wouldn't it? Well, I don't know. I didn't think to ask him. <sighs> uh, I think I'll go down to the bank. I'll be back directly. Kitty. Hello, Matt. Uh, you're up early this morning. 
I went to bed early last night. Uh, oh, where were you headed? Delmonico's. Heard they got some fresh eggs in last month. <laughs> You're spoiled. But I'll go with you if you like. I'd like it fine, Matt. I gotta see Mr. Bodkin at the bank here first. Why don't you go on ahead and I'll join you, huh? Well, how long will you be? Oh, just a couple of minutes. I'll wait in the bank for you. Okay. But if you're longer than a couple of minutes, you can find me at the restaurant. I'm feeling pretty healthy this morning. <laughs> you ought to go to bed early every night. If I did, I couldn't afford breakfast. This place looks deserted. We must be the only people up in Dodge. Except for the cashier there. Maybe you ought to wait till after breakfast, Matt. No, Kitty, I'm afraid this business has waited too long as it is. October 16th, 1954, Gunsmoke on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. You know, it's true. Difficult times have a way of focusing us. We have to think about what matters most when it comes to our spending, our health care. No doubt. This is why so many people are joining MediShare right now. MediShare is a trusted way to save up to 50% on your monthly health care costs. More than 400,000 people have already made the switch it's pretty obvious why, too, especially now during this challenging season with health care costs and out-of-pocket expenses going up. MediShare can save you a lot of money. The typical family saves $500 a month. And MediShare is a Christian health care sharing ministry that's worked beautifully for 29 years. There are different options to choose from to fit your budget. I'll give you the number here in a second. And if you call, you can get a price within two minutes. Maybe now is the perfect time to make the switch and start saving. Here you go. Call 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, more of Gunsmoke, October 16th, 1954. <laughs> Marshal Dillon, come in. Morning, Mr. Bodkin. You uh, come to deposit money, Marshal, or to borrow some? Uh, well, neither. I uh, I came to protect it. What? Mr. Bodkin, did you ever hear of the Carp Brothers? Oh, I know, Marshal. I don't believe I have. Well, they've never been around Dodge. All I know is that they're brothers, and the older one's name is Joe. Well, why are you telling me this, Marshal? Well, I've heard that they're headed for Dodge, and I've heard that they're bank robbers. Bank robbers? Well, what do you plan to do? Well, I can't hire deputies until after a crime's been committed, Mr. Botkin, but if you'd like to, it might be a good idea to let a half a dozen of them or so loaf around here for a while. Certainly, certainly, Marshal. I don't mind a little expense. What? What's that? That's them now. Where's my gun? Don't shoot. Or we kill the woman. I got kidding. We're not shooting. They'd kill the cashier. Hank, get around there and start filling that sack. Yeah. All right, lady. You walk in front of me. Either one of you try something, she dies. He's coming this way, Marshal. Shoot him. Don't be a fool. Kitty's in the way. Besides, he's got a gun in her back. They're robbing my bank. Shut up. And I'll shoot him. Kitty's on you. My hands are up, mister. He was going to shoot. And I was smart of you. Well, I'll be. I caught the Marshal himself. Well, I will have as soon as I get his gun. Don't move now. I'm not moving. And this is the first time I ever disarmed a lawman. Feels good. Joe Carp. How'd you know my name? Well, I heard you were headed this way, Carp, but I didn't hear it in time. You sure didn't, Marshal. Is that your brother you came in with? What difference does it make? Look, take your money, Carp. Take it, and I'll ride out with you, and nobody will bother you. No, Matt. Shut up, Kitty. Oh. Oh, I see. Nobody will shoot at you if I'm along. Not while we're in Dodge, maybe, but we'd be followed. Then take me with you, as far as you like. No, Marshal. 
We'd be followed anyway. I got a better idea. We're taking her, Kitty. Don't do it, Carp. Of course I'll do it. And first sign I see we're being chased, whoever it is going to find Kitty laying right in the trail. Fresh killed. And if you don't think I'll do it, I'll tell you something. First person I ever killed was a woman. So don't let nobody follow us. Nobody else will follow you, I promise you that. I'd hate to lose such a pretty girl. Matt, it's all right. Forget it. Sure. A risk, kid. You go in that office and sit down, Marshal. Hank's got the money ready. We're leaving. So I'm kidding. Hello. Nobody seems to hurt me kill the cashier. So don't you run out and tell nobody, Marshal. I won't. Hey, Marshal, if I do shoot Kitty, I promise you one thing. Yeah. I'll do it with your gun. Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what, Chester? You think they'll give her any breakfast? Uh, No. No. People don't need much food, Chester. They can go for days without any at all. Well, I know that, Doc, but Miss Kitty just ain't used to it. It's water people need. They'll have water. Huh. They will if they took any with them. It's mighty dry out on the prairie this time. But it's not that dry. Any fool can find water sooner or later. Sure, if he follows a buffalo herd long enough, about a week, maybe. There's other ways, Chester. Like what? You ever hear of a divining rod? Oh, for land's sake. What the outlaws do with they divine in? I right? wasn't talking about outlaws. What was it? Well, I was just talking, can't a man oh, talk? Just about a safety. Safety. Yes, sir. I, I guess we've waited long enough. They must have covered three or four miles by now. Yes, sir. Is everything ready? Well, everything I could think of, Mr. Dillon. All right, let's get going. Uh, well, well, good luck, Matt. Thanks, Doc. Keep an eye on things. It may be a long time before we get back. From the bank window, I'd watch the Carp brothers ride north out of Dodge. So Chester and I started off in the same direction. On the other side of the Arkansas, we picked up their trail and followed it easily all morning. But we were careful to stay way behind them and out of sight. Although we probably could have run them down in a few hours. That was the hardest part of it. Forcing ourselves to hold back. Go slow. Mr. Dillon, you think Carp would really do it? Do what, Justin? You know. Do you? Yeah. Justin, Mm -hmm. look up ahead there on the ground. Mr. Dillon. Let's see who it is. Come in, Mr. Dillon, some cowboy. He's been shot. Bring your water back. Yes, sir. Holly's still breathing. Yeah, pour a little water on him, huh? Yes, sir. Yeah. Hey, fella. You want a drink? Uh, hey, you thirsty? Well, uh, some more. Here. Who are you? Marshal Dillon from Dodge. Tell me what happened, huh? Them two men and that girl, it was... Hold my head up, Marshal. Is that better? Yeah, full of blood, Marshal. They hurt me bad. Yeah. Blaine is my name, Blaine. Well, what happened? Well, them two men, Marshal, and I know that girl oughtn't to be with them. I could tell the way she looked at me. You're after him, ain't you? I'm after him. Well, I seen them, and I rode up, and I asked them who they was. 
They didn't like the horse. No. I know something was wrong with that girl and all, but but I ain't no gunman. They shot me right out of my saddle. Both of them to once. We'll get them, Blaine. If that's any help to you. Well, it don't matter now. That girl had not ought to be with him. Could you hear them? Did they say anything? Yeah. Something about a, a cabin, but I don't know where. Yeah. Look, Blaine, my partner here, Chester, he'll stay with you. Sure will. I'll take care of you, Blaine. Oh, thanks, but, but it won't do no good. You'd better go off and help catch him, fellas. I'll handle him. Take whatever you want off my saddle, Chester, and get a fire going here. Yes, sir. Uh, you'll uh, be fine, Blaine. So long. I rode ahead, tracking slowly for a couple of hours. Then I saw a dust cloud behind me. I stopped and waited. It was Chester. He rode up and looked at me for a moment. Then without saying a word, we continued on the trail across the prairie. We traveled in silence until dark. And then we saw a cabin. I couldn't chance going up to it, so we unsaddled and turned our horses loose and crept into a little draw about a hundred yards away. Got down and waited. We waited all night. Dawn came, and then the sun, hot as ever. Ain't they nearer coming out of that cabin, Mr. Jones? Yeah, sooner or later, Chester. Look, they got a fire going now. Smoke's coming out of the chimney. Breakfast. I'm so hungry. Now, why don't you chew on some of that slippery elm bark of yours? Slippery elm don't fill your belly. Now, a man can get along without food, Chester. Like Doc said. Well, which Miss Kitty's gonna get something to eat? Yeah. Mr. Dillon, what in the world are we gonna do? Well, right now, there's nothing we can do but sit here and wait and keep quiet. You know what'll happen if they find out we're here. I know, but I ain't thinking about it. You better get back down now. I'll stay up here and where I can watch. Yeah, but they could see you, Mr. Dillon. Now, I got a little bunch of buffalo grass in front of me here. It's enough. Yes, sir. Getting hot. Keep your voice low, Chester. Okay. You know, if it wasn't for them in the cabin, it'd be awful peaceful out here, wouldn't it? Yeah. Dylan. What? It's a rattlesnake he's behind on the hole. I'm gonna tie these back to your head. Oh, whatever you do, don't move, Chester. Don't even breathe if you can help it. He's looking at me now, Mr. Dillon. How long is he? I can't see him. He, he, he's a big one. Maybe three and a half, four foot. Huh. I can't see you either. How far are you from him? Far enough. Unless he uncoils, moves up. I'll just keep very still. Let me go away. He ain't about to go away. Did you move? Just a little. Oh, don't do it again. Mr. Dillon, he's stretching out. He's, he's, he's moving. Which way? Toward you. Uh, steady. He stopped. He's coiling again. Chester? Yes, sir. Look, if that snake strikes at me, don't yell. He'll hear you in the cabin. Just start thinking about it now. If he strikes you, just close your eyes and stop breathing. You hear me? Well, I'll try. You'll do it. You understand? Yes, sir. You must have moved, Chester. You must have 
And I, I, I got my rifle aimed at him. Now you stop it. You get your finger off that trigger and now. Well, I can't sit here and watch that rattler strike you. If you shoot, Kitty will die. Don't you know that? I, I, I didn't mean it. You know, I didn't mean he's looking at you now. Well, let him look. I, I got to do something. I can't sit here and walk this. Wait a minute. Uh, listen to me. I, I got an idea. What? Are you chewing? Huh? Are you chewing? Oh. No, not right now, but I got a fairly fresh squid of slippery almond shirt pocket. Okay. No chance it. You get that quid into your mouth, but you do it slow. Slow and as steady as you can manage it. And once you start moving your hand, don't stop. You understand? All right, go ahead. Okay, sure. What for? Well, I'll tell you when you get it in your mouth. You doing it? Yeah, I already got my fingers in my pocket. There he is. Oh, slow and steady now. I'm crying. Gunsmoke, October 16th, 1954, on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. The conclusion follows these important messages. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of Gunsmoke, Kitty Cott. October 16th, 1954. It's in the mouth now. Oh, juice it up, Chester. Got a big mouthful. I am. All right. You know, I've heard you brag about how good you can spit. Can you hit that rattler from there? Maybe. Well, Okay. Do it. Well, I, I only got one shot. I, I, I can't make it. I, I can't do it. Wait a minute. You got a mouthful? I'll have you. Yes, sir. All right, swallow some of it. Just a little bit. Now go on, swallow. I did. Now let it sit a minute. How's it feel? Like whiskey. Raw whiskey. All right. Now take your time. Make a move. Make him look at you. And then splatter him right in the eyes. Okay. Go ahead. Snake. Hey, snake. Look. Mr. Young, I got him. He's leaving. There he goes. He's gone. It worked. <sighs> they can't stay in that cabin forever, Mr. Young. They'll die of the heat cooped up in there. It's only about 10 o'clock, Chester. My, I hope they gave Miss Kitty some breakfast. Shh. Now the door's open. They coming out? I got your rifle. Easy now. It was Miss Kitty. Yeah. That's Joe Carp behind her. Now there's his brother. They're all outside now. What are, what are we going to do? We're going to kill him, Chester. You mean this... Shoot him down from here, cold blooded. How would you want to do it? I'm ready, Mr. Neal. All right, then take the one on your side. That's the brother. I'll take Joe. Okay, he's standing awful close to it. Yeah, she is. Now, when I say hold your breath, you do it. And then count to yourself. One, two, three. And then fire. I'm set. All right. Hold your breath. All right, let's go, Chester. 
Get back inside, Kitty. Joe Carp's still alive, Mr. Dillon. He's reaching for his gun. What? They're dead. They're both dead now. Okay, Kitty. You all right? Good to see you, man. Thank you, Chester. You all right, I said? Got them down like dogs, didn't you? Hey, you bet we did. Thank you, man. Huh? Well, for pity's sake, you... She done fainted, Mr. Dillon. Well, it's a good thing you caught her. Here, I'll carry her inside, Chester. Come on, we'll get some breakfast going. They probably didn't feed her after all. under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Lawrence Dobkin, and Joe Duvall. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. October 16, 1954, Gunsmoke on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, part two of the nine-part Yours Truly Johnny Dollar story, The Phantom Chase Matter, October 16, 1956. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. George Everson, Mr. Dollar. Oh, yes, Mr. Everson. I've been thinking. Uh, I could have been wrong last night. You mean about the newspaper picture of the bar in New Orleans? Yes, that man in the background of the picture, the way he sits, the way he holds his hands and his head, it, it's so like Tom James. Yeah, that's what you told me last night. Yes, but this morning, well, you know, things always look different in the morning. After all, we can't see very much of his face in the picture. It, it might be just a wild goose chase. Well, I've been on plenty of them, believe me. But I've been thinking too, Mr. Everson. Tom Chase embezzled $120,000 from your firm. New Orleans would be as good a place for him to hide as any. Besides which, his wife told me he was very fond of jazz, and there's certainly plenty of that down there. And you really think it might be a possibility? My plane leaves for New Orleans in an hour. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location New Orleans, Louisiana to the Home Office, Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Phantom Chase Matter. Expense account continued. Item 5350, cab fare to the airport. George Everson was waiting for me at the passenger ramp. I'll tell you, Mr. Dollar, before I came out here to the airport, I called the insurance company you represent in this investigation. Oh? I told them if this trip to New Orleans did turn out to be just a wild goose chase that I would assume your expenses... Oh, well, that's very considerate of you, Mr. Everson, but it isn't necessary. Now, an investigation's an investigation. My company's willing and anxious to exhaust all the possibilities. And from what you tell me, it's a good possibility that Tom Chase is hiding in New Orleans. Well, I hope so. Say, look, I've still got a minute or two before my plane loads. I want to make sure I've got all the facts straight. All right. Tom Chase was your junior partner. He began to specialize in those clients of yours who made long-term investments. Right. One of them decided to sell out suddenly, and you discovered there was a lot less in his account than there should have been. You ordered an audit and found that other accounts of Tom's had been juggled, too, to the tune of $120,000. Roughly. He was arrested but wouldn't talk. He got on on bail and jumped his bail and disappeared. Yes? All right. His wife, Lola, says that for some time before that, he was moody and tense. Well, uh, look, I didn't mention this to her, but I will tell you... 
Do you have any reason to think that Chase was interested in another woman? No, no reason at all. Good Lord, Mr. Dollar, with a wife like Lola, a man would be out of his mind to even think of anyone else. Well, I'm just mentioning a possibility, Mr. Everson. Yeah, I know, and I suppose that always is a possibility in embezzlement cases. But I certainly hope not in this one. The, the whole thing's been hard enough on Lola as it is. Yeah, did you tell her about the newspaper picture and that I'm going to New Orleans? No, I decided not to mention it to her for the present. I didn't want to get her hopes up. Although, heaven knows, she doesn't have much to hope for under the circumstances. Yeah. Oh, well, my plane's loading. Well, so long, Mr. Everson. Yes, best of luck, Mr. Dollar. I'll be waiting for word from you. Don't count on much. Oh, people have hit the jackpot on the first nickel. I know. But oftener than not, they turn up three lemons instead. <laughs> Expense item six, $114. Transportation and incidentals to New Orleans. I checked in at a hotel and headed for the quarter. It hadn't changed much. Maybe a little more neon here and there. But the same streets, the same lattice work, the same noises. Then as I was walking along the sidewalk, something came hurtling down through the air at me. I jumped to one side. It was a basket at the end of a rope. A man from a little grocery store came out, put some food in the basket, and the lady in the upstairs window hauled it up again. <laughs> no, the quarter hadn't changed much. It was after dark when I located Ace's Castle, a bar that had been shown in the New York newspaper. There weren't many people inside. A few couples scattered around, a single or two at the bar, the bartender. And over in one corner, a small band making slow, sad music. I went over to the bar. Evening, sir. Hi. Scotch and soda, please. Okay. A little slow tonight, huh? It's early. It'll pick up. Yeah. Thanks. This is the bar that was in the New York newspaper picture, isn't it? Yes, sir. This is the place. That must have been good for business, huh? Tourists. This isn't a tourist spot. What kind of a spot is it? People from around the street here come in, have a drink or two, nurse their own private troubles or forget them, and listen to Pops. Pops? Pops Harker. The old man over there with the trumpet. Oh. Hey, he plays like he means it. He does. Do you mind taking a look at this newspaper picture? So what about it? Well, this guy in the background sitting at the bar. Yeah? Know him? Not particularly. What do you mean, not particularly? A lot of guys come in here. Should I know all of them? All right, here. Here's a front view of the man I'm looking for. Recognize him? Afraid not, sir. Afraid I can't help you. Ever hear the name Tom Chase? Chase? Not that I remember. Uh, this man in the newspaper picture, is his name Tom Chase? Well, uh, could be. I'm not sure. Well, if he's around the street somewhere, you'll probably run into him sooner or later. How do you figure? People on the street don't leave it much. Oh, well of its own, huh? I suppose. Sort of an upside-down world, but a world, I guess. Seems to be what they want. So you think if my friend Tom Chase is here on the street somewhere, he's liable to stay here? Most of them do. Then it looks like you're going to have a steady customer for a while. We can always use him. Why don't you go talk to Pops, the old boy playing the trumpet there? He's got quite a memory. Maybe he could help you. Thanks. I will. Pop was way off at Never Never Land. He looked as old as Africa. He wore dark glasses. And the horn he was blowing looked like he'd either found it or made it. <laughs> Real cool, Pops. Thank you, Daddy. Me and the boys were just warming up. That was a warm-up? Oh, it ain't what it used to be. We'll still hold up for a while, I guess. <laughs> I think it will. Yeah, you talk to that horn real pretty. <laughs> it went on talk back to Count's daddy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, maybe you can help me, Pops. You got troubles? In a way. I'm looking for somebody. Oh, lots of people got troubles, Daddy. No, that's not quite what I mean. It's a... Uh... Well, it's a fellow named Tom Chase. Ever hear the name around here? Chase? Yeah, there was a side man in Chicago once named Tom Chase. No. In the 20s it was. No, sorry, wrong, Chase. Uh, the one I'm looking for is under 40. Only Tom Chase I remember was the old one. You been around here much? One you looking for? Maybe. What kind of voice he got? 
Oh, I don't know. Why? I remember voices. If I heard his, maybe I remember it. Well, look, I can do better than that, Pops. I got a picture of him right here. That don't do me no good. Why not? I'm blind, Daddy. Basin Street, boys. <laughs> I think I knew now why he could blow the kind of music he did. It had to make up for a lot of things. I guess it was the only way he could see. Item seven, two dollars, drinks for me. I sat there in Ace's castle for a couple of hours, waiting. Waiting for Tom Chase to show up, or for the guy who looked like him to show up, so I'd know for sure whether this was a wild goose chase. But nothing happened. A few people slowly drifted in and out. Mostly, they huddled around Pops Harker, nursing their drinks and listening. It got to be midnight, and I just about decided to give up when a man with a face like a weasel slid into the chair across the table from me. You're nine dollar? Johnny dollar? That's right. Who are you? Freddie Quintana. So? So you should be glad to see me. Should I? Any particular reason, Quintana? Oh, the best. It's around the street that you're looking for somebody, dollar. News travels first. Yeah, when it's really interesting news like that. Oh, what's so interesting about it? Whenever I smell dough, it is always interesting. Well, maybe your nose is too sensitive or too long. There was no mention of money. Look, I've been around, Dollar. Oh, I don't doubt that. Yeah, a lot of people who float around the street and the quarter don't want to be found. Oh? So a guy comes looking for somebody, it usually costs him a little money to find him. I see. And you're looking for a guy named Tom Chase. So? So, I think I got him pegged. Where is he? Oh, not so fast, Dollar. Not so fast. First we talk money, hmm? You're wrong there, Freddy. What do you mean? First we make sure you know what you're talking about. Now, look now, You Mr. look. I've bumped into a lot of characters like you. And more than a fair share of them were just trying to ace into a deal for a fast buck without I'll any... I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I got the guy pegged. Describe him. Yeah. Tall, good deal, probably a good-looking guy when he shaves, curly hair, brown eyes. How am I doing? Not bad, but I take a lot of convincing. Look, you looking for this guy, you just want to talk about him. I just want proof. Okay. I'll get to it. Bring him here. That'll be proof enough. You kidding? Hmm. It ain't that easy, and you know it. This guy don't want to be found. I know that the minute I spot him. He's going under the name of Tom James. Tom James? Yeah, I'd ring a bell. Maybe. His full name is Thomas James Chase. He could be using the first two names as an alias. Sure. Yeah, that's a familiar pattern. Sure. Okay, Quintana, suppose you do give me some proof. What do you want? 500 bucks. Oh, that's a lot of money. I think you want Chase at all. Uh, I'd have to get an okay for my company. You could arrange it. Maybe, maybe. And that brings us back to the question of proof again. I'll be back in an hour, Dollar, with proof. Daddy. Yeah? Hey, what is it, boss? That man you was talking to. He's a bad one. Oh? I can tell from his voice, Daddy. Yeah, I know what you mean. You don't want to mess around with a bad one like that. Unfortunately, he could have something I need. Is that the reason? Oh, well, maybe not a good one, but it's part of my job. Maybe you got yourself the wrong kind of job then, Daddy. You know, Pops, sometimes I think you're right. Hello, Freddy. Right back on time. Yeah, yeah, with the goods, too. Yeah. Take a look. It's all crumpled up. What is it? Well, I'll smooth it out. I think it's a letter he started writing and threw it away. Where'd you get it? I paid a little visit to his room when he was out. I fished it out of the wastebasket. Okay. Lola, when you get this, I'll be far away. Don't try to find me. It's better this way. I don't know how to explain, but ends there. Well, what you think? Is he your boy? I can tell you in about ten seconds. I fished the sample of Chase's handwriting out of my pocket and compared it to the half-finished letter. I'm no expert, but I didn't have to be. There was no doubt about it. It was Chase's handwriting. So it looked as though my trip was going to pay off after all. Tom Chase was right here in New Orleans. Now, here's our star to tell you about the next exciting episode of this story. There's a little game of chance called Dealer's Choice. Fine. 
until the dealer gets dealt out the hard way. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Starting to sound pretty cut and dry, didn't it? Well, why is it a nine-part episode instead of a five-part? And you'll find that out, well, soon. Thank you for tuning in. Oh, that's yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Uh, That episode originally broadcast on October 16th, 1956. Thanks for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. We appreciate you making it by. Hope you'll thank this station and support their advertisers, their kindness and courtesy that we're here each and every time we roll around here on your favorite station. Your input means a lot to this station. And uh, you can always hear our shows on demand, classicradio.stream, classicradio.stream. Stream our shows, find links to download the shows. You can also learn more about building a classic radio collection of your own. Our social media links are there as well. And you can also uh, contact me or buy me a coffee that helps us to acquire more great classic radio collections to bring to you here on this program. Thanks for tuning in. Tell all your friends that great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station. <laughs>